Okay, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, he says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So if you can imagine uh, uh, what this verse is talking about, if, if God leaves footprints, then as a follower, this is what the word follower means, you'd be putting your foot where his footprint is. You wouldn't be trying to have your own way. Okay, you would, you would want to duplicate him to the utmost. So it, the, the goal would be that by you following him, you can't even see your footprint. It's him. Amen. Okay. So verse 2, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and has given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Okay. Now, uh, walk in love, that's actually an action statement. It's not unlike in structure, walk in faith or walk by faith. We walk by faith and not by sight. Walk means lifestyle. Amen. So when it's talking about walking in love, we have a, a lifestyle of love. Hallelujah. Uh, which is the way we live. Okay. Now, so love, like it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, is not boasting and proud and has its own way and uh, insisting on its own rights and all of that stuff. That, that has absolutely nothing to do with Christian lifestyle even though you see a lot of Christians acting like that, making a public display of themselves. That like, you know, and so they attract, unfortunately, they attract many unknowing people to follow that same way. But what that is, the Bible calls that vanity. Because the attraction is to the way of a person, not the way of the Lord. Woo. God is good. Okay, so uh, go with me, if you would, please. We're just going to kind of uh, go through some passages about this. Romans chapter 8. Hallelujah. So uh, remember that what he says here, uh, let me read it to you again. Walk in love as Christ also loved us. So we're going to use Jesus as a pattern. Okay. Uh, has given himself to us for an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Okay? Now, giving yourself to the Lord. I know this is not popular. Okay? But you, you can't have this close relationship with the Lord. Now, if you're thinking, well, I'm not sure that I'm ready to make this kind of a commitment yet to a church. I understand. Okay? But uh, to all of the rest of you, what I'm saying is that you need to sink some roots. Because, uh, one, one person called it become a part of the woodwork of the church. Yeah, I'm not saying you're not. I mean, I don't know. I'm just preaching the word. Amen. But if you want to get close to him, it's not going to be accomplished by you running pillar to post with your own vision, your own way. That's not New Testament. We don't have a vision. The vision comes from here. He says, write the vision. There's where it's written. I didn't write it. You didn't write it. Amen. Hallelujah. God is good. I'm glad I came to church tonight. Okay. Uh, so if we're going to model this after Jesus, here's some central things. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Let's just stop for a minute and talk to you. Okay? So what he's saying is you've been set free from the law of sin and death. Therefore, there's no condemnation for you. That's another way of saying you cannot be condemned. You, you cannot be judged. You've already been judged. Yeah, when Jesus' blood was applied to you, 
The judgment that he took for us on Calvary became your gift. The gift of righteousness. Hallelujah. So we've been made righteous by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's no condemnation for us. Now, expand that out a little bit. Uh, that it, we are also, that includes all curses. So nobody can curse you. See, because Jesus set you free, he redeemed you from the curse of the law. Nobody has the right or the authority to put a curse on you. Okay, so no one can condemn you. All right. So if we accept that about ourselves, then we also have to, if we're going to walk in love, we have to accept that same thing about other people. See, we can't go around condemning people. Now, that actually becomes a way of life for people because uh, the way the world system is set up is there's got to be somebody on top so that they can stand on somebody on the bottom. That's just the way it works. And the justification for standing on people is condemnation. They were born to that. Now, uh, it's not, not, you don't see it like in, you know, on the front page in America. But this, this is a uh, like age old class distinction. Now, you could go to other parts of the world where we can see very clearly, culturally, other people's class distinctions. Okay. Was a very common way of order being maintained in the recent past, man with man. Somebody had to be on top, standing on somebody else. That's, that's what Jesus talked about, about it shall not be so among you, he said. That, you know, that's the way the, the world operates. He said, but you, uh, if, if you want to be a leader, you have to be a servant. So it's not about you being elevated. Hallelujah. Now, these are, like I said, this is not popular ideas in our culture, but these are freeing things. So uh, it's not uncommon for us in our culture to look down on people. And the more uh, kind of substantial people become, the more tendency they have to look down. And that's where the condemnation comes from. Because there has to be a justification for why people treat people like that. And so, you know, they, they all have a conscience. So they try to create a way to deal with their conscience saying, you know, well, uh, they were born to that. So uh, what the world system, the way the world system operates on that tier level is it's designed such that people never get out of the tier that they're born into, okay? That's actually, uh, forgive me for getting so precise with you, but that's actually the Tower of Babel. It's in layers, okay? Now, so one of the reasons why the United States of America has seen such a flourish in 200 years is because this country espoused biblical principles to give people the opportunity to rise from the place that they were born into. Which is the reason why a person in Richmond, Virginia can be born in the project from a, a generational past of poverty and you can uh, end up living in the West End. Happens right here. Amen. Good possibility it happened to you. <laughs> it happened to me. Okay, now I, I personally didn't rise through the system. Uh, I turned my life over to Jesus and he did this for me. You know, I, I have nice clothes, live in a nice house, have plenty of food to eat. Praise the Lord, drive a, a relatively new car. You know, I'm, I'm blessed. Yeah. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. You probably are too. Okay. So uh, as, and, and I believe God raised you up. Okay. But also a little bit of credit of this should go to the United States because here the laws allow you to rise. Okay. Now, so I'll give you an example. I'm not saying that the same thing couldn't happen somewhere else. But in the United States, you can actually buy a piece of the ground. But in other parts of the world, there's not the open market on the ground. It's just not available. Amen. So uh, we uh, met some uh, pastor people down in Brazil. Pastor Sheree and I went down there. And the pastor of the largest church in Rio de Janeiro told us that in Brazil, uh, there's no property for sale. There is no buying or selling of property. If, if you get a facility or a place, you have to enter into a long-term lease, but nobody can buy it. Now, that's not uncommon. So if you've ever traveled, how many of you have traveled? And you wonder, why is there a shanty town right there? Well, that's, you know, basically the shanty town was made out of garbage. And nobody owned that. So people live there because they can. And they will not be allowed in to the environment that the other people hold. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. God is good. Are you out there tonight? Thank you, Lord Jesus. So, uh, you live in a blessed place. You ought to be thankful for that. I am. Hallelujah. I'm glad that the United States is here. Amen. God is good. So, it uh, helps. It's a uh, positive environment because of the structure of the society that uh, instead of being held down, now, if you were to go to another part of the world where this is not permitted, uh, it's not just the purchase of ground, but I mean, you, you can't even uh, buy something that's outside of your zone. They won't allow, they won't trade with you. Yeah. We, we've been to different parts of the world where they wouldn't even let us start a bank account. Because they were afraid, when we told them what we were going to do, that we were going to help little people, they didn't want anybody helping little people. So they wouldn't even let the bank work with us. Talking about heads of government. Yeah, come on, are you out there? You ought to be thankful. But if, if you're looking at the world and trying to figure out the way it is, that those are big parts of it. Okay? God is good. So condemnation is just a tool of oppression. People learn the ways of condemnation. So people have learned how to put you down. Ooh. So walking in love means, okay, Lord, I'm not going to do that to other people. I'm not going to put people down. Amen. Amen. So, um, you know, these things are ingrained in people. So um, it has to be worked out. And so the local church environment is a perfect place to learn how to walk in love. So to a certain extent, it's a challenging environment to be in church because God is going to uh, work on you. He's going to sand on the spots that need to be sanded. He's going to make it possible for him, for God, to put a needy person next to you without you tearing them up. He's going to smooth you out. Ooh, thank you, Lord. You, you might not have ever heard anything like this. Okay? Just New Testament teaching. 
Okay. So let's look at another one. Go over to 1 John 1, 9. Now, I would venture to say that everybody in this room is familiar with 1 John 1, 9. Okay. So he said, what it says is if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay. Now, strong possibility, you learned how to use that verse in your own life as a tool. Blood of Jesus washing you clean. That actually is the only way to get free from the power of sin. Okay? And so when people have bondage in their lives, the underlying bondage is always connected to sin. Now, they might tell you something else, but there would be no bondage if there was no sin. So the thing to do with sin is to uh, get past, you know, just the uncomfortable feeling that it's something that you don't do. Because everybody has sinned. Everybody does sin, and I'm not saying that you have to sin, okay? But you have learned, if, if you got victory in your life, you faced sin. Without playing games about it, trying to act like, no, you don't, you know, you're too perfect to have ever, <laughs> see, that, that's not victory. That's called narcissism which is a uh, disorder. <laughs> okay, but if you have victory in your life, then you've learned how to do this. And you exercise dominion in your own life using that principle. When the devil shows up, one of the first things you do is you go back to the blood. Why is the devil here? Lord Jesus, if I've done something to let him in, I ask you to forgive me. Wash me right now, Lord Jesus, I ask in your precious blood so that I will be cleansed. Now, every believer should be able to do that. All right, so that's a way of life for us. Okay, so what the verse that I read to you, um, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 says, if he did that for you, then walking in love is doing that same thing for other people. Now, there's built-in uh, lack unforgiveness, lack of forgiveness in our culture. Okay? It, it's, it becomes a part of life for uh, in, in this environment. I'm not saying it's you. I'm talking about the culture, not you. Okay? But people are actually trained not to forgive people. This is the reason why when somebody gets out of prison, they're treated like, you know, they have a disease. I'm talking about in church. Are you there? God is good. And uh, just the way the, the laws are structured, and I'm not faulting the law, I'm just telling you what people have done with this. Because it's the conscience of the people that can't handle the law. There's nothing wrong with the law, it's the thing that's wrong with the people. Oh, but you're a new creature. So you ought to be able to read Romans chapter 13. And have respect for the law. Obey the law yourself. Amen. But at the same time, be willing to grant forgiveness, which is a real practical thing. Grant forgiveness to people that have created infractions. Ooh, God is good. Are you out there? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, uh, you know, corporations, let's just talk about this for a minute. America in business, there's all sorts of restrictions uh, for people uh, to be able to get a job and things of that nature. Are you there? Okay. 
Now, so we're not faulting, I, I'm telling you, I'm not faulting the laws, okay? But what I am saying to you is the way you walk relative to others. See, it's, a, it's, a, it's an art, actually a fine art, to teach somebody who has spent the better part of their life going against the grain, but actually show them how they can learn how to have respect for the law. Because, the, the, you know, it, law is a God thing. Woo! See, that went over not as good as it could have. <laughs> because, you see, if you're still associating the law with man then, uh, yeah, man is not just. So Romans chapter 13 is not justifying man. It's justifying the law. There's a difference. So, so you've got to be able to separate the two. If, if you can't see that, then you're going to have a hard time walking in fellowship with people who need to walk in forgiveness. Because, you know, it's just like every step, they're going to run into things. Is, is this too deep for you? Every step, they're going to run into things where they're going to be challenged. It's not a challenge to, to you. But if you set the wrong example, oh, that's just the, you know, you don't have to uh, do what they say to do. Okay, you're sowing the wrong seed. Amen. That's not walking in love. Because what ultimately was, is what going to happen, what's going to happen, that person's going to be challenged in that environment. See, it gets down to how you influence people. Are you there? Is that too complicated? Amen. Hallelujah. So this is not just about us. It's about others. Walking in love well, the definition of that is this, it's about other people. How are you going to walk in love with yourself? I mean, I guess you can. You know, you just have to spend a lot of time in front of the mirror. <laughs> a little humor. Are you there? So, but in the same way, this is all through the New Testament, in the same way that God has forgiven you and you accept his forgiveness. Now, th this is an amazing thing. You know, when you watch behavior with believers, you know, they are so glad they're forgiven, but they're so glad that that other one over there is pinned down. Hallelujah. <clears throat> God is good. So here, here's a, uh, uh, a thought. When a person is convicted of a crime and they go to jail and they pay their debt to society and they come out, the reason why the, the institution is letting them go is because they've paid their due. Okay? Hallelujah. So, uh, you're not going to change the law, but the way you relate to people determines how they're going to see, how am I going to get out of this? Because I, I can tell you that, you know, time and time again, uh, people get rejected. And then they, they run into people like us. You know, and, and I personally have helped a lot of people getting out of prison to find a way in life, through the mercies of God. It's not going to come by you criticizing the law. So I personally realized, okay, I'm going to have to bury any kind of innate bad attitudes that I've had in the past about the law so I can walk in love towards that brother. Because he can't walk in the same discretion that I have. I'm going to have to show him another way. Who are you out there? 
Hallelujah. It's just like that, that, that story that I told you about uh, that, the guy with the alcohol. So, I don't have a struggle with alcohol. I can sit right next to it. It has absolutely no power over me. Zero, none, zero, zilcho. Okay? But that guy, he, he couldn't get, you know, on the same block with alcohol. So love is seeing what he needs to hold steady. Not me. It's not me. It's him. So the higher way is the love walk. Ooh, are you getting something out of this? Same way with forgiveness. So all of these things have a practical application. Hallelujah. So, you know, somebody that's had a history uh, with courts and prison, for them to learn how to use their faith to break the power of sin in their life, which disables the case that the devil has on them. See, if they don't get the sin thing taken care of by faith, the devil is going to set a trap for them. He uses people to do it. Okay. But this, this is the greatest thing that people can learn in life, how to walk. So how to walk in love, okay, which involves how to use your faith to get sin out and keep it underfoot. You've been given dominion over sin. Romans chapter 6. Amen. Are you there? Okay, so... Uh, Last thing, go over to Matthew chapter 7. This one's a little bit more complicated, but uh, hallelujah. God is good. How many of you are getting something out of this? You're certainly doing some uh, deep chewing here. Praise you, Jesus. This is all about the body of Christ. <clears throat> Just remember that phrase being baked into the loaf. Amen. So God puts you in the loaf because you're an ingredient to the mix. Now you got to be willing to be put in and then he turns the heat up. You know, bakes off the things that don't fit. But the heat combines the ingredients. So you end up, you lose part of yourself and become a part of something bigger. Some people don't like that. The definition of not liking that, for the record, is pride. People don't want to lose their personal identity to who they are in Christ. Yeah, that's called pride. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is good. The greatest freedom you'll ever know is to be who you are in Christ Jesus. God is good. Okay, so Matthew chapter 7, Jesus is preaching. Verses 1 and 2 again. He says, judge not that you be not judged. Okay, we'll come back to that statement. Okay, verse 2. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet or measure out, it'll be measured to you again. Now, so just stop for a moment and, and realize about yourself, okay? When you got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost, found out about the blood of Jesus, there's a very good possibility that you became non-judgmental about yourself, You're, you uh, kind of let yourself off the hook. You're not self-condemning. You're not self-destructive. Are you there? Amen. You treat yourself uh, kindly. You cut yourself a wide swath. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you there? Okay. Now, at the same time, you uh, have discretion about your own behavior, and you can tell when you're off the wall. You know what it's like to be off the wall? It's like you stick out like a sore thumb. It, yeah. So, like a public place, you just get louder and louder. 
Yeah, to prove you're right. The louder you get, the wronger you get. Okay. Hallelujah. <clears throat> okay, so that's the same exact thing. See, we have become non-judgmental on ourselves. Otherwise, you'd have a real struggle with your own conscience. But, you know, you, like, you're gracious with yourself, just like God is gracious with you. You cut yourself a little slack. Yeah. You're not judgmental. Starts with you, right? Okay. <clears throat> well, what God is saying is just take that same thing and apply that to other people so that you're not judgmental of other people. See, because like what Jesus is, like if you have two, two different standards here, like you're, you're one way with yourself, but you want to hold everybody else to the line, okay? then uh, that's going to backfire on you just like what he said. You actually can't live like that. Hallelujah. So whatever standard you try to hold other people to, what's actually going to happen is you're going to be held to that same standard. It's going to come back on you. Okay? So if you don't want to live a life of judgment in your life all the time, judgmentalism and, you know, critical, fault-finding, et cetera, then uh, the same way, he, what Jesus is saying is to the extent that you sow non-judgmentalism towards other people, that's what you're going to reap. You're going to reap some grace. Now, a couple of things about this that are important. God is gracious. By nature, he's gracious. Okay? And uh, we don't deserve it. We never did anything to earn it. That's the truth. It's not just talk. His grace gives you the ability to do things that you really can't do, which needs to be remembered, that if it wasn't for his grace, you, like the, whatever you're doing in life right now, you would never would have gotten there without the grace of God. I mean, you'd still be scraping and you might not even be alive. It's by the grace of God. So God is gracious. This is just his nature. He's kind. So like, you know, when people kind of rub you the wrong way and you want to blast them a little bit or something like that, okay, that's not God. <laughs> He's not like that. You ought to be thankful because he would have blasted us all off. Like, poof, that would have been it. We would have been gone. Okay, so he's long-suffering. He puts up with people's stuff. He put up with yours. All of that goes into this thing about not being judgmental. See, it's all part of the same cookie, the same loaf. Thank you, Lord Jesus. God is good. Okay, so walking in love uh, is not... A mystery. Sometimes, you know, when people talk about these things, they make it sound like nobody can do it, nobody has do it, done it, and nobody even knows what it is. Well, that's not true. I mean, these are just three little simple things that we pulled out of the Scripture, and all we did was apply it to ourselves first, and then applied it to relationships with other people. Now, so here's a little off the subject, but uh, here's the thing that turns you into a person that other people can follow. It's not what you say, it's what you do. See, they're watching what you do. Th this is actually a leadership principle. So, so people, you know, they, they teach all these principles on leadership and then it comes down to, okay, it's real simple. It's what you do is what they're going to do. So that's another way of saying 
that you have to do this. So in the church, in the body of Christ, if we want people to walk in love, we have to model that. Okay? And recognizing none of us have completely arrived. Are you there? This is, this is the humility that's necessary. We all have work to do, and he says that he's still working on us. Which, you see, when we have a presentation of ourselves like that, then people who know that they got a long ways to go, they don't feel uncomfortable around you. Because they can see that, yeah, and you say it, you know, uh, God is still working on me. I'll give you an example and then we'll close. Okay, people, when raising children, a lot of times when people are raising children, parents will not admit their faults to their kids. They insist on, you know, uh, upholding this air of invincibility. Like they're afraid that if they show any sign of weakness, their kids are just going to run them over or something, I guess. But uh, that's not New Testament Christianity. Okay? So people keep things from their kids. Okay? Then later their kids find out and they're, to them their parents are phonies. They lied to them. Okay? So this is the way the New Testament church operates. See, now we don't air people's dirty laundry in front of you because that's not love. Okay? But we have to constantly model the love walk, which involves, and, and you, you should understand this is not weakness on our part. Okay? God gives people a chance to make it, He gives people chances. Okay, so a lot of times the church is just wanting to pour hot lead on people. Oh, look what they did. Let's, let's do something about that. Wait a minute, wait a minute. God might want to do it differently. Right. Remember, he's gracious, kind, loving, merciful, long-suffering. Are you out there? Okay, so a lot of times he keeps us out of other people's stuff because he's giving them a chance. So I, I say all the time to the Lord, I say, Lord, you know, why didn't you tell me about that? Well, because it was none of your business. I was doing the same thing with them that I've done with you. Now, here's an example. Judas was on Jesus' staff. Right at the table with him until the night before he was crucified. Betrayed him in the Garden of Gethsemane. But Jesus never broke with Judas. He was there until the end. He didn't have to. Ooh, thank you, Lord Jesus. Jesus even knew he was there. He talked about it on several occasions. There's one of you that will betray me, he told the other ones. Amen. Amen. God is good. So now there's an example of the, the way God deals with people's faults. I, I, I you know, think that, that, well, it's an example. But it's possible. See, Judas had the opportunity to repent right up until the end. Of course, he didn't take it. And when God makes statements from a preordination standpoint, he's not willing that for people. He's simply saying what he already knows they're going to do. So he's not condemning people. He just knows ahead of time. So maybe that was one of the things with Judas. God was giving, it, giving him the right up until the last minute, even though it was already written in the scripture that somebody was going to do it to betray Jesus. Come on and say amen. Are you out there? Hallelujah. These are uh, deeper things. Hallelujah. 
So uh, when you grow up as a believer, you can hear meat. I hope this has blessed you. Glory to God. God is good. Yeah, God needs to be able to talk to you like you're an adult. Are you an adult? I'm talking about in the kingdom. I'm not talking about your physical body. I, ooh, hallelujah. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you, Lord Jesus. So he builds us up. So, so here, here, here's a couple of things about being built up. Because this is involving a kingdom and where he's taking us. See, he's got to build up people who are strong enough to deal with complicated, d tough situations. Without going the wrong direction with it, without it eating them up, chew chewing them up etc. So if you're wondering what he's doing with you, if you're willing to be matured, that is what he's going to do with you. He's going to teach you how to stand. And uh, not everybody can stand. Sometimes people just run for cover. And you're left standing there and you're thinking, Lord, why did they leave? Well, they couldn't stand. Stand the heat. Hallelujah. But if you're willing, he'll bake you into the loaf. He'll make a pillar out of you. God is good.